Right. Uh, I hope uh, everyone is in the best of their spirits post lunch. Uh, so let's get started. Uh, I would like to call upon our moderator uh, for the panel discussion, which is uh, Specialized Supply Chain Strategies for Pharma and uh, FMCG Sector. Uh, we'll focus on sustainable and effective usage of procurement and infrastructure. So let me call upon uh, stage the moderator for this panel discussion. Uh, Mr. Ravind Mithe, the partner for management consulting practice for KPMG. Please come on board, sir. Uh, now we will call upon our esteemed panelists uh, for this panel discussion. Uh, Mr. Chandra Mohan Gupta, uh, director of supply chain uh, for Coca Cola. Please come, sir. Dr. Ravi Prakash uh, Mathur, senior director of supply chain for Dr. Reddy's lab. Mr. DVR Rajiv Mohan, Vice President Commodities, Agri Business Division for ITC. Please come on board. Mr. Arjun Verma, the Director for Supply Chain for Nivea India. Mr. Pradeep Panikar, Chief Commercial Officer, Delhi International Airport. And that completes the panel. So I hand over this uh, to our moderator, Mr. Ravin Mithe. Please. Thank you. Thank you very much, and uh, very good afternoon to all. Uh, when I came in the hall about 25 minutes before, I found that uh, panelists were more and participants were and the audience was less. I was a little worried. But I'm glad that it's a small house, and people who are really interested have come here. Typically, when you do uh, sessions like this post lunch, uh, small sessions, and I hope the lights will not get dim. <laughs> so, uh, typically, uh, there are three things which are very difficult to do in life. One is, um, if you want to climb the wall, it is inclined towards you, it's difficult to climb that wall. Um, second is to uh, kiss somebody who is inclining away from you. That was a difficult thing for a short man like me. <laughs> And third is to uh, moderate discussion of this time in the second half of the day. So I am doing the third part of it. Having tried first two and then found it very difficult. So uh, welcome all of you. Uh, this is a uh, very interesting session. And we have uh, here two industries and one supplier in terms of infrastructure. And two industries which are extremely unique, uh, very specialized, uh, where deep procurement relationships are very key for success. Without a very strong back-end supply chain, uh, you, are, you can't really be successful. That is the backbone of the business in pharma as well as the FMCG. Uh, and there they mm -hmm. like the role of uh, service providers, uh, particularly if you have a cold chain or a cargo and all that. So we have a, a panel of uh, people who have spent their lives, understand the sector very well. And uh, today, if you really see, uh, we have been talking since morning, supply chain job is a difficult job. Uh, it is a thankless job sort of thing. If everything goes right, nobody remembers supply chain manager. If something goes wrong, one delay shipment and all hell gets loose. You will agree with me. A lot, a lot of, of smiles. A mm -hmm. lot of smiles in the crowd as well. Mm -hmm. So we share that uh, uh, kind of sentiment, yet uh, because there is a passion uh, with us, we do this work. Otherwise, doing this kind of role is not easy. It is not a role which you can do from sitting from a setting. Unless you have real passion, real ability to work under uh, volatile situation, uncertain situation, complex situation, ambiguous situation, you really cannot uh, do a good job. So I have, I'm very fortunate to have a panel of that time. And if you see today, uh, we are uh, at a situation where uh, as if there's a long night is getting over, hopefully, and a big day is starting in the Indian economy. Uh, we have been talking in person about past three years, things are not been very easy for industry. Yet pharma has grown, yet s and has grown. It's very interesting to see. Though their profitability has come down by about 700%. But they have grown. And now we are talking about uh, uh, hopefully a big leap, uh, big growth area as a country. And these two industries uh, are 
very important because uh, government has talked about health being the priority. Today's statement came from the health minister, health being a, is a more priority for, for India. And 50 medicines are getting to be zero cost in the, in the CBT to everybody. And FMGB is where uh, the, the additional uh, money which comes, disposable income which comes, uh, finds its way, and we have a large middle class growing. Particularly, money is coming to the hands of the uh, farmers, uh, and that is where, uh, and paradoxically, you can get coke there, but you can't get a paracetamol there uh, in the villages. So, that is the supply chain and distribution in the country. So, uh, in, that, in, in that scenario, what uh, we would like to discuss as a panel is uh, how procurement and infrastructure are playing the key role. What kind of uh, uh, experiences have been there in the last few years of collaboration, with trying out new models? Uh, we have experience of ITC, which is a great experience of uh, right from uh, farm to port sort of thing. Dr. Dodi had the experience of uh, building large supplier base, uh, large import content coming in, in the case of media. So, uh, what has worked? If you can tell us something, what has worked for you successfully? And then we'll also talk about what are the challenges. And also, uh, in the given scenario, as we progress towards end, if time permits, we'll also like to know from you. Do you see in the infrastructure space of for both your industry uh, entry of large MNC players going to happen, if at all, because of the investment which is required? So, what I would request panelists is, is to spend for a couple of minutes each to talk about their organizational industry, what is unique, uh, what is so special about them in this phase, and uh, based on that, then we'll pick up the thread. Uh, I would like to give good amount of time for question and answers because uh, I would not like to pose my questions but I would like to hear questions from you and, and make uh, the panelists answer those questions. So let's start uh, uh, with uh, maybe uh, Pradeep, uh, you can sure. start with uh, Dr. Reddy's experience. Okay. Yeah. What has been your uh, experience in last few years in procurement space? Yeah, thank you Ryan. And, uh, and uh, thanks to all the audience for you know, coming as you said to the graveyard tip. Uh, of the of the conference, you know, because uh, everybody you know wants to have a quiet nap, uh, but we'll try to keep you engaged. Uh, so thanks for this opportunity. Uh, you know, I'll just take five minutes to give you a, a flavor of uh, procurement as it pertains to the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, now you're all familiar how the purchase function or the procurement function uh, functions in various industries, but in pharma there is uh, an additional dimension to it. Uh, because the generic pharma business model primarily is about uh, launching new products and once that new demand stream uh, is there in the system, then stabilizing that demand stream. So there are two distinct demand streams. You know, one is for a new product launch, which is a, by definition the business model, and then there is the established demand, the demand stream. Now to back that demand stream up, you ha also have a distinction in the procurement function also. So what you do in the development stage or the design stage of the drug has a long-term uh, effect on your efficiency or, 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 or what your performance is. So procurement in pharma tends to get strategic in nature because the vendors that you tie in, the specs that you uh, finalize, the approvals that you get, they become very, uh, they become very difficult to change. So that's why uh, in the design stage or the development stage itself, the strategic intent of your of your philosophy, procurement philosophy, it has to reflect and also that reflects in your partnering philosophy. So to, to that extent there is a distinction between any other procurement uh, philosophy or some other industry might have. So that is the way procurement and pharma tends to be strategic in nature. So the motion uh, statement I'd like to maybe okay. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, I mean to um, uh, Coke mm -hmm. uh, actually uh, with a large distribution setup at the same time a large large number of uh, plants across the country and the need of having procurement function, some centralized, some decentralized. So how do you operate and what are the challenges? So uh, if, if, if the panel can permit me and the audience can permit me, we would want to take two minutes quickly to uh, talk about Coca-Cola. One is um, making this bottle of beverage is no rocket science. Okay. So it is something which uh, 
is very simple. Uh, the the crux or the success of the business lies in how efficiently you are doing it, and whatever you do in your supply chain, are you doing it efficiently? So, as a company, we have been in existence for about 128 years now. So, to talk about sustainability, the number of years that the company, has, the organisation has, has existed, speaks a lot. And two is because we operate on a very large platform. Uh, we operate in almost all countries in the world except two countries. Uh, the sheer scale gives us that efficiency and effectiveness. So, if I were to focus on these two subjects, which is sustainability, and the other is the efficiency and the effectiveness, whether one is talking about manufacturing, one is talking about uh, procurement. Uh, we have ample examples where we have been very successful uh, and uh, let me try to uh, sort of exemplify this uh, by giving you uh, one example in each of these buckets. Uh, the first one is what comes to my mind is something uh, uh, as simple as the pulp or the mango that goes into a drink called maza. Uh, as a manufacturing company, one could limit the supply chain to say your pulp processor and stop at that and say that I want this specification, I want um, uh, this quantity at this price and that's it. Uh, but because you have to be, you have been in existence for 128 years, you, you want to see the next 128 years, you would go beyond that and you would look at can the particular partner sustain sustainably give you the same quality, the same, I mean, increasing quantity at a competitive price for the next 20 years? So you will tend to start working with him very closely. You will try to connect with level one or level two of his supply chain. So for a company like us, we go to level where you are talking to people who are supplying seeds or the cattle, the farmer, the farmer growing the crop, giving it to a consolidator, the consolidator giving it to the processor, and the processor giving it to the processor. So it goes to that level of uh, back end in, in terms of upstream uh, and with great level of integration. So you are clearly measuring uh, how uh, how the, uh, the input is walking in into your supply chain. So this is one aspect of sustainability and the way we design our procurement system. The other that I can talk about is about uh, the way we consume fuel. Uh, we have 57 odd manufacturing locations in the country. And if you were to look at the sheer mass that we convert into beverages and we put it out in the market, uh, we, are a, we are a very big consumer of energy. And uh, so, so, so you have various formats of energy. You have electricity, you have petrol, you have uh, gas. We as a company globally have taken a call that when we look at any aspect of our business, uh, we want to operate on a platform uh, which we call the me, we, and the world. Me sending what is good for me we as a collective group and the world which is the environment and the ecosystem beyond the organization. And there, because that is the strategy, it has been clearly laid out that if you are taking something from the environment and if there is an alternate available, then the company will go and invest, will go and find and uh, partner with organizations which can give us that alternate. So what have we done? We converted all our furnaces in the, in the plant which consume furnace oil, which is a crude product, to a biomass which normally in normal uh, nomenclature is called briquette. So you have rice husk, you have agricultural waste, which otherwise would be just burnt out. It is, con it is concentrated, it is converted into briquette and it flows into our plant. So again, an example where you will have to build a procurement system. You will have to define what your strategy is. 
and then according to the timing that Yeah. Uh, so let me go to a completely different dimension uh, to you, uh, Arjun. Uh, both of them talk about strategic relationships and uh, very long sustainability focus in terms of from farm onwards. In your case, uh, in India, how do you manage your last 60 percent almost in import component domestic domestically? How do you manage this equipment supply chain in terms of sustainability? And in terms of making sure that this cost effective, given the uh, fluctuations in the current situation, and all that. Uh, so thank you for that uh, question. And uh, uh, just to talk a bit more about Media for as an organization. So Media is part of an organization called Biosphere. Uh, so it's an organization which was set up in 1882. So it's more than 130 years uh, old organization. And the overriding principle, I think, on which which uh, uh, the organization functions is to provide the consumer uh, with the best quality skincare products in the world. So we are the number one skincare company in the world, and hence the the uh, the key word out here is quality. So when when Chandramohan was talking about strategic uh, partnership, so now it's going to work only on the procurement uh, part. I think media works even more uh, uh, in relationships which are strategic in nature. So uh, we have a lot of our procurement, which is both uh, global for our global, obviously for our global portfolio, and even for our local portfolio. Uh, the intent is more from a quality standpoint. So even the cans which go into the deodorant products, okay, the quality uh, which, which we we went through a series where we evaluated a lot of can suppliers in India. And at some stage, we said that maybe the can development uh, setup in India today is not ready for the quality which media needs to bring into India, and we and we are sourcing the can from outside. Okay, now uh, uh, so that that's the emphasis on quality, but that doesn't mean that we do not get uh, sourcing efficiency. So the way it works is the Biosdoc is a highly globally integrated organization from a uh, procurement uh, purchase standpoint, and and we have relationships which are managed at a global level with. Certain of the key suppliers, and that's where we get sourcing leverage. Okay. Now there are uh, obviously other. Uh, there's other aspect of that uh, wherein a lot of our portfolio is local, which we have a tactical management of relationship. But the key intent from an India standpoint is uh, uh, that is strategic. Uh, Now I I just wanted to debate uh, from this and maybe talk about my previous organization also, uh, which is Kitolu, uh, uh, which is in the snack space. Now that's the, uh, that's at the other end of the spectrum. Okay. So while here you would have longer lead times in India and you would have global sourcing which will be happening, that's extremely practical. What Chandramohan uh, was uh, talking about, going right down to the uh, tuber, which is the seed of the potato, which needs to be gestated and grown. So we, uh, the company starts from there, uh, is growing the seed, which go into the farm. There are thousands of acres which are uh, uh, signed off along with farmers. And potato is grown, so nearly 60 percent of the potato is uh, uh, sourced from there and left on the market, and uh, and and that's a different level of uh, setup. Mm -hmm. So we'll elaborate as we go through uh, that yes. as we go. So, so mm -hmm. there's no one size fits all. That's the only basic, uh, yeah. I think, first yeah. customized to the industry and to the uh, business and the product which uh, every company operates. On. So, what is uh, your experience? Uh, you are kind of a pioneer in this. ITC has been pioneering, mm -hmm. particularly in bringing wealth to the farmers. And each of all is a very well-known initiative to all of us. Uh, how, what kind of things have happened in recent past which are absolutely stunning in nature? Yeah, I mean, uh, if I can just start by uh, giving uh, uh, this thing of the Indian agriculture, uh, where. We actually have a paradox where we actually have surplus production, but uh, as a person who is procuring it, you actually are faced with scarcity. Uh, you actually have high production, but you have farmers who are impoverished because of a whole lot of inefficiencies which are there, whether it is cost inefficiencies or inefficiencies in terms of the process, in terms of uh, the way things are sold. So I'll just take the example of food grain. That uh, if you take it during the season, the farmer actually cannot get into the mandi because it's so jam-packed. And uh, 
if it's outside the season, then he doesn't get a price because there are hardly any buyers for it. So how do you go about uh, building an efficient and effective procurement system in this kind of a scenario? Uh, and this is where uh, I think through experience, uh, what we had understood is that uh, that you need to actually go a step beyond collaboration. You actually need to now look at co-creation. And that's where the uh, each of all concept was conceived by ITC. Uh, I mean, for those of you who are not aware of it, it's basically an e-kiosk which is set up in a village. And it's actually, when I said co-creation, it's actually set up in a farmer's house. So the people who actually run it, uh, the people who partner us in the entire system are the farmers. So it's actually something which is done by the farmers for the farmers. So it is this kiosk which is there in a farmer's house and through this uh, internet connection, uh, we give the farmers information so he doesn't have to transact with us. He has access to all kinds of information on cropping practices, on the weather, uh, what he needs to do at which particular point of time, whether he needs to transplant, he needs to add fertilizer, he needs to use pesticides. And uh, there's a Q&A section where farmers who have any queries can actually get in touch with our experts and we kind of get them the information. And during the procurement season, sitting there in his village, he can get to know what the prices are for that day. And if he's so willing, then he can actually sit in his village and sell the wheat to us or sell the soybean to us. And this coordinator farmer, whom we call as the Sanchala, would actually uh, examine the sample. And he would be in a position, because he's trained by us, he would be in a position to offer the price. And if the deal is struck between the two of them, between the two farmers in the village, then he gets the uh, food grain or the wheat or the soya bean to our uh, nearest procurement center, uh, hub as we would call it, and then we would take up the procurement. So in this way, what we have done is, uh, apart from disintermediation, where a whole number of layers of intermediaries have been cut away, you actually start transacting directly with the farmer which helps in a whole lot of things in terms of traceability, quality, uh, preserving the identity of the varieties, uh, whatever geographical advantages in terms of quality are there when you buy from certain procurement zones. And it's these advantages which we are able to give to the consumer also in terms of the quality and quality of the product. Uh, and this is the way if you go about looking at any particular agri commodity, whether it's food grains, fruits and vegetables, dairy, poultry, you will have to look at customizing the supply chain to the extent where uh, both the producers and the consumers benefit and if they both benefit then hopefully the all the other stakeholders in the value chain will benefit. Very good. Excellent. Excellent. So in this uh, uh, situation, Dilip, how uh, do you see roles for people like you who are in the preservation and transportation business, I have to say? For particular food products and farmer products. So what kind of things do you see happening and what are you doing in this area? Uh, thank you, Ravin. Uh, actually, sitting on a panel where uh, there are two farmer players and uh, three uh, FMCG guys, and that too coming from a se uh, segment which is basically one of the legs of the entire supply chain, more to do with the airport part. We actually just provide a small part of the entire value chain in terms of value. What do, what do we do? As Delhi Airport, if you see, most of the people actually for a year would have traveled through our facilities as a passenger. But I don't know how many of you actually would have actually gone and seen the cargo part. Even the cargo part has been modernized to a great extent. It's still under modernization. What we have done is over the last uh, two, three years, we have created a large facility for uh, pharma as well as for the food chain products. Almost 50,000 square feet of the facility has been created with three distinct temperature zones. And both we have two cargo terminal operators now. It's of serious competition. So they do offer fair services, competing facilities, and thereby the quality of service has been improved. So this facility has been created. There has also been a growth in the pharma. Last uh, year we grew almost to 25% in pharma. In the perishable, it was about 15%. Because these are the two facilities which use temperature control. But having said that, the capacity created is significantly larger. It's almost like we can be uh, we can handle about one lakh twenty-five thousand tons of cargo. Both put together, we are handling about 40,000 tons, 40,000 tons. So there's a huge demand supply gap in terms of. But 
Delhi perhaps is one of the few airports, maybe along with Hyderabad, which has today the capacity to handle this. Maybe Bangalore has it to some extent. But other airports in India still don't have that facility. So there is a huge gap. And a facility in Delhi really can't help a person in Chennai or, a, or in Kolkata. Because, you know, these are, I mean, zones which are actually going to cater to the OMB traffic jet. And these being, I mean, it's not uh, feasible for a person to bring his cargo all the way by road to from Chennai to Delhi and thereafter. I mean, it can't be. As it is, there is a huge uh, complaint or a no off stated fact that uh, a product goes by air only when it is time sensitive and it's perhaps perishable in the physical nature. And if you put it on the ground more than actually on the air, it is the already the case, and further put it on the road, it's going to be a problem. So therefore, I don't see that as an alternative. We need to have good facilities all over the country. And this is a booming sector. Pharma is really going to grow big. And uh, there is a huge amount of potential and demand for the products externally. Similarly, a lot of these products, which may be in India, and almost they import a huge amount of products, 50% of their products imported. So there's going to be in incoming demand also for us. And we at the airport would be ready to provide the infrastructure we required by the uh, stakeholders here. But we only, as I said at the very beginning, we only are one part of the entire cog of the circle. If you look at the entire transaction, I mean the shipper, then there's a freight forwarder, then there's a trucker, then there's a CHA, and it comes in, I mean, then it goes into the cargo terminal, the airline. So there are so many different segments. Of course, uh, we are trying to align, I mean, in the industry we have formed something called an air cargo board in India, which is actually trying to align all the people. So we have shippers come in, talk to us, what are the problems we face. So we try to solve the problem to a great extent. But yes, these are all initiatives that in the very beginning. And I think with that, I would just hand it back to you, Ravind, and yes. maybe you can just take a talk from there. So good. we have a, a great amount of diversity. But what I hear the common thread coming is strategic uh, nature of partnership. Very, very key. Also, uh, scale and sustainability part of it. And co-creation of wealth. The supplier and customer are kind of joined at the fit for a situation. Now, when you created this kind of thing, and going forward next three to five years time, when it really we grow as a country 8% plus, and there's a huge consumer demand, and there's a huge amount of focus on healthcare which happens, and we really become bigger hub of pharma manufacturing for the world. How do you see the role of the procurement manager changing from what it was to what it is going to be. Because if you, if you change as a reaction, then you are missed the bus perhaps, or you are learning by making mistakes. But you being the company that is very progressive in nature, how are you changing proactively the role of your procurement function? And what are their focus areas you are putting? Because all the otherwise I hear only two things from procurement managers. One is cost, and secondly, why it has not come so far. So, given these two which are typically short term because you have to meet your budget targets and you have to also make your lines run, in, in the light of what you have said so far, how do you see these two connecting? Yeah. Uh, so, maybe you can start and others can join. Yes. You want me to start? Yeah, I go ahead. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, this, is, uh, this is fairly public, uh, publicized statement. You know, uh, Muta Khan, who is our global CEO, was asked this question, you know, what is what troubles him most, you know, as an executive of the company. And he said that uh, I have sleepless nights, not because I'm not going to meet my business plans, or I'm not going to meet my market share numbers, or I'm not going to deliver uh, the profit numbers. He, he, what gives me sleepless nights is the brand reputation. Uh, the reputation of the brand which has been built for the last 128 years. Okay. So, this is a very, very strong message. It is part of the company's DNA. For us, when we look at bringing in procurement managers and then we train them and we build capability, quality is something which is kept at the topmost level. All of us would have heard stories about, uh, you know, if, if, if your bread, for example, the, 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 the shopkeeper who gives you bread, 
and uh, you know you find some foreign particle in the bread what will you do about it probably you'll do nothing about it and you'll just ignore it and say you know okay bad luck hard luck but if you get a foreign particle <laughs> in a coke <laughs> bottle or something going missing with the product uh, we have a variety of consumer claims with walking it could be as serious as somebody coming and saying you know what i want them like okay the other guy comes and says you know uh, so a variety of things why i am mentioning this is that when we have procurement managers walking in into our system uh, we train them for the first 60 days to keep the focus on quality number 1 the number 2 is the supply continuity and number 3 would be cost and facility so we would we would orient them in them in such a manner that these priorities are well understood and they are acted upon so i hope that answers yeah. Yeah. so what the structure is do normally you guys do always things right first time right so in, in pharma you know you have no other choice so because uh, you know this is medicine this is only mm-hmm. like you know the next uh, and my emphasis can be low in quality quality is the baseline which is hygiene so there is no compromise to compliance uh, uh, compliance and there's no uh, compromise on quality so so that is the starting uh, that is the starting line for us um, but you know what is uh, start you know mentioned you know that procurement job of procurement is always about cost and here and now and uh, cost and focus of procurement Uh, and I think not only in pharma, across many industries, this shift has is happening from a transactional, uh, independent purchase uh, kind of an orientation uh, to more strategic uh, and product-specific uh, focus on procurement. So when you do this, uh, when this shift happens, and you look at a very product-specific strategy, so basically the the uh, data points are when you look at it in in certain materials. But what is the impact on your end product of that input material? One, uh, does it have a very high impact? If it has a very high impact, the process will become. You need to have a very strategic approach to it. And the other, the other factor is that what is the complexity or the difficulty of the of obtaining the obtaining the material? So if you have a very high impact uh, input material, which is very difficult to obtain, then you have a very different approach to partner and co-creation and co-development. That kind of an approach you have, but if it is a material which has a very less impact on your end product, and also the complexity is not much, then of course you can go in for a short-term uh, strategy like getting the best price or uh, reducing the buying power. So I think a very segmented approach to where what you are buying basically. So and accordingly create also a processes and structures internally that help you segment your purchase uh, to the two by two matches. So yeah. that is the that is the shift I think that has happened. Uh, Okay. So, are you getting people more from other functions with their experience? Because it is a more of it, not only commercial buying, it is also a lot to do with understanding the so chemistry so part of it. Chemistry part, of it. okay, okay. So, so you are by at least to be uh, pretty much conversant with the with the product. So, in IT kind of situation, uh, how does a role of procurement change? Uh, what has happened? Because one is the large, very large buying portfolio across the country. Number two, uh, you have multiple internal customers to serve, from FMCG to export and all that. So in this situation, how does the role of a buyer you see uh, changing, or what have you done to make this happen? Change. See, uh, going forward, I think the role of the buyer will not just be uh, really managing the. Uh, Quality, size, and like you said, has it arrived or has it left? Kind of a thing. Uh, we'll actually have to look at people who are capable of bringing about uh, very fundamental changes in the way we look at things and operate. Uh, like, for example, if we take food grains today, uh, India produces about 250 million tons of food grains, and nearly one fifth of it, about 18 to 20 percent, is wasted. So that's about 55. million metric tons now uh, how do you kind of create a, a supply chain which reduces this wastage because if you look at it we still uh, use bags and 
So the weight of bags varies as you move from one state to the other. In some places it's 100 kgs, in some places, cases it's 60 kgs, in some it's 50, and in some it's, I mean, you just weigh it and then see what it weighs. So actually, can we move to a bagless kind of a supply chain where we have these huge silos? We also have transportation which moves it in bulk, loose, in that form. We also need, if you take fruits and vegetables out of the 74,000 crore uh, fruits and vegetables, the value of fruits and vegetables produced in India, again about 15-18% is wasted. Mm. So can you actually have people who can envisage and develop these integrated cold chains which not just deal with fruits and vegetables but it's integrated where it takes care of fruits and vegetables, dairy, poultry, everything together so that it all gets integrated across the major producing and consuming centers. The third thing is that if you look at Europe and take a place like uh, Holland, 90% of Europe's flowers are actually auctioned in Holland, in a single place, in a single hall. Mm -hmm. It's called Flora, Flora Holland. Can we have that kind of uh, integrated e-procurement system in India for various kinds of agri-produce where you know the price discovery is a lot more transparent, mm. uh, the quality is known and the farmer and the buyer they both get the fair price. And the last thing I think we need to look at is a whole degree of standardization in agriculture because today what is quality A for me is actually quality B for somebody else. So can we bring in standardization not just in quality but also in the whole aspect of packaging, transportation, lot sizes, unit sizes and everything so that all this integration and IT enablement becomes possible. So I think the role of the procurement manager going forward is how he envisages and develops all these things, not just looking merely at the transactional part of it, but also at the infrastructure and very interesting. part so of horizon it. horizon becomes very yeah. large, very Absolutely. large and large. So, so it's span increases. Yeah. So, uh, Arjun, in your case, uh, uh, SMCG, large reach, imports and now getting you are starting your own manufacturing in India. Yeah. How do you see the role of procurement changing? So uh, I think uh, we start with the consumer okay. and uh, if you really look at the consumer of India today, uh, whether he is at the upper end and whether he is at the lower end, his uh, aspiration of the person uh, are nearly there. In the, in the sense, if you look at it, uh, leave, leave aside the very high-end uh, consumers, but if you look at people just below that particular threshold, their aspirations are nearly the same, but what they can put down as a put-down price uh, to buy the product at a given point of time, that keeps on changing at different places. So uh, this is one of our realizations which we had and very strong realizations, and, uh, and uh, this is what uh, uh, kind of convinced us that we need to get something in, with, with in India which uh, really is the need of the hour for the people who are above so the first 30 million households we can uh, we cater to but uh, the rest of them is what we do not cater because our price points do not uh, allow because we do a lot of our uh, uh, key product sourcing from outside and we need to localize the product but if you start localizing the production one of the key key uh, pieces of that is you can't be importing all the rmnc and what i was talking about earlier in terms of building the ecosystem in india the procurement team specifically has to start working towards uh, uh, successfully uh, integrating and uh, partnering with people in India to deliver the same quality of product uh, in lo lower denominations in India and make that entire activity uh, uh, successful. And, and it's very easier said than done. It's, it's an incredible uh, process and we are going through that particular transition. And, um, and, and the biggest fear in an organization, as what Sandra Mohan was saying, and, and uh, I was privy to some discussions at our end also in the last week at the very highest level uh, in the organization. And uh, exactly the same thoughts uh, are echoed. That, and here is the mother brand. Don't, whatever you do, don't allow that mother brand to be tampered with. So uh, the, the question is, and how procurement will really uh, work in the next five years is all about how they successfully transition the ecosystem which is staying outside India from a quality and a uh, standpoint to an Indian environment which also provides the cost. So the cost and the value equation, the value equation, where they call it, is uh, what we to get to. And that's what, uh, and as you rightly pointed out, I think one of the clear mindsets when you look at people is their, their understanding of how to transition uh, 
different tire or something. So this is a typical challenge of any import substitution kind of uh, industry. It's not a challenge of only the import substitution. It's, it's also a challenge of say even local uh, players. Now, uh, the my last organization was a foods organization. Uh, one of the experiences which were being recounted by uh, a senior leader who had come into India, they went into a household which earns around 1500 rupees uh, a month. And uh, so they asked the mother, yeah, do you, uh, do you uh, take any packet snacks? And she said, yes, yes, once in a, once in a month I, I buy a 5 rupee kurkure uh, packet and I give it to my child. And they said that, how do you, uh, so out of 1500 rupees living in Bombay giving a 5 rupee packet to, a, uh, to the child, she said that when I give that packet to my child, the delight which I see, obviously in Hindi, what was being conversed with, the delight which I see in the child is unparalleled and, and I would like to invest that. So it's a question of providing that quality. Now that 5 rupee uh, packet, you can actually get a 10 rupee kind of a quantity for that 5 rupee, but the person wants to give that 5 rupee to the because of the quality quantity. The, the people want that quality, they want to invest that in their children, uh, but the question is how do you transition that and the same dilemma will address locally also. So any organization which has got a local ecosystem of self-contained system even today, how do you get the value equation back? So it forms the pride in going to value, that's yeah. it. So maybe in the entire discussion we are about procurement and uh, I am sure uh, you must be feeling lost as well. What is procurement for you? But let's take the question for you. In your case, uh, many of them are your customers. So how does the role of the person who serves them, your services, and to your service forwarders, how would this change in? Uh, see, the customer is becoming demanding and there is uh, no doubt about that. Rightfully so, because you see, I mean, 10, 15 years back, uh, if uh, you used to walk into the airport, the cargo would be lying there for, I mean, uh, even, you know, if, uh, if 70, 18 days, imported cargo would be lying. Even today, it's about four, four and a half days. It's ridiculous. Imagine, I mean, the entire journey is come into India in flying, even if for the furthest, most part of the world, it's hardly 24, 24 hours. And still after reaching India, there are parties who clear it out. There are parties who take out the product during six hours time flight from the time the aircraft lands. I mean, some of them are sitting there perhaps again. But there are others who would actually not take up the process of clearing the cargo till the cargo comes in. Then they will think about it. Then they'll have to run to get the finances for it, to pay the duty. It is not the customs who sits on it for a long time or the airport operator who sits on it for a long time. It is the you know, relaxity or the relaxed mode it comes in. There is even today a three day free period. There's no demerit for three days. So almost all of them are waiting that. So, you know, <laughs> it still there is no, I mean, there's no, there's no, inf I mean, I, I don't know whether these people know it also. You know, they depend on the kind of service provider they, they may be their point to get the cargo. Many of them start doing it themselves because of these problems. So there are issues. But yes, the expectations are high. We have the infrastructure and the ability to provide it. We can do it for almost all the customers if they want to come and take the delivery in six hours. It's a matter of, I mean, the more it's there. So when it comes, then when the everything is done, everything is clear. Because even customers today, they are also working on an EDI module. And an EDI module, despite all its problems, is an electronic module. So the world is more. In fact, there was a time, point in time, where the goods used to move more faster than the messages. And that is also now changed. Now the messages do come in early. Yes, it's a matter of bringing an efficiency in the whole system. There's a need. And we're willing to work with any uh, provider, any customer who wants it, and we will be delighted to do Excellent. So I, I think uh, uh, we have uh, 15 minutes more to go, I suppose. And I would leave uh, to now uh, make it open to audience to ask questions to the panel. And uh, it would be nice if you ask questions which are if you will get an insightful answer from them more than what I was, I am able to uh, insight from them. So I'll open to you. You can share. Uh, you can share your name, and uh, can you pass on my share? Yeah. I'm Rajesh Sharma, and uh, my question to uh, uh, gentleman from Reddy and uh, from uh, this airport. Uh, uh, I'm from Panisha Biotech. We import medicines uh, in APIs. 
uh, you told me three days uh, nobody charged them rent. But I've seen uh, some time uh, material product is listed in India, API. Even then the product is uh, held up at the airport, they take sample and then send them center like laboratory. This is hard earned money we spend we, because we whatever we get it is uh, LC or uh, it is uh, basically advanced payment dollars basically. So holding consignment product is listed uh, for a week or ten days I I could not get it because already product is listed in uh, India to did the CGI and uh, custom stop that uh, hold that louder. Just just like yeah. Custom, uh, custom hold that uh, material, product is listed and uh, they can take sample uh, and they can send to CDL and meantime they can allow company to pass on that goods to the uh, factory. At least uh, uh, testing can start at factories and they, they, this way we can save, you know, uh, lead time. So, uh, Dr. Reddy people also experience that kind of things or it is uh, unique to us or uh, what is your you know, uh, take on this?
Seema Kapoor and the present thing is a brilliant life science. Yeah. 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 Uh, we've observed a lot of uh, temperature excursions that happen at the airport. And the data logger generally indicates that those are not happening at the warehouse. They generally happen at the time of loading, mm -hmm. loading into the aircraft. So how can the airport authority help us in controlling that? Actually, uh, what you're talking about is right. Uh, as what has happened many a time with the airline is that they tend to pay the cargo into the temperature control facility, but they have space, say, in another pallet they're building, which is not temperature controlled. So many times you've seen this cargo move into that area. And we are not so much aware of what the temperature control requirements are many a time. And so the airline sometimes does that element. Not all of them, very few of them, but they do that. So, and then they don't store it in the temperature control area again. It again goes back to general cargo. So that's where these incursions do happen and uh, there are problems. So we have started investigating this and we have stated that, you know, SLA should be maintained because pharma is a big sector and we don't want to lose that. That's why we are insisting that, you know, we do maintain some kind of a... Yeah, I think I suggest I mean, we should have a separate loading facility also then for pharma shipments. If we are having a separate warehouse, yeah. it should not uh, be loaded at the general Meaning facility. loading, I don't get it. Means that the, the air side or on the land side? Whichever. I mean, the, if no, we, are, yeah, you know, I mean, we are paying a higher cost for sending a pharma shipment and ultimately the shipment gets be, rejected yeah, just yeah. because the temperature was not maintained. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so you have a very valid point. So very good question. In spite of all the pharma zones and the temperature control, uh, control conditions you might gain inside the building of the airport, globally it is And like even uh, while getting from the plant, we take all the precautions, we send it in a reaper truck, and just, uh, you know, the loading time of five to seven hours, the excursion so happens and the shipment yeah. gets rejected. Yeah. And there's no control a shipper can actually do. Yeah. Yeah. So your, it's a globally accepted fact that the excursions or shipment experiences why they take the permat is the point where, where it gets the maximum exposure. It is not when you are unloading it from, from your reaper truck into the airport from the, or, uh, or, or or from your factory into the truck. It is at a permat. You know, sometimes the, the turnaround time could be a couple of hours. Uh, so, you know, exporters fix it at their own end by, you know, having different kind of solutions like thermal blankets or white But then those are very costly options, you know. Those, those, those are quite uh, costly options, but you know, when you have to take care of the product, these are, these are expenditures that you need to uh, invest in, you know. And also, you can also speak to your airlines, you know, there are, for example, airlines that travel via the Middle East, where the outside temperatures are much higher than what you experience in India. So some airlines, I'll not, I'll not take names, they invest in, you know, equipment like dollies, you know, these are temperature controlled dollies. Uh, and the airline also has reaper trucks to transport the products from the okay. aircraft into the, to, to the air side. So I think, you know... Yeah, I think just to add to what you said, you know, the, the, in the Delhi airport, one of the cargo terminal operators have actually put a dolly, which is a temperature control dolly. It is already available, but uh, none of the airlines really want to use it. It's a matter of the cost again, you know. I mean, I mean, the pricing is cheap uh, to such an extent that then you say we become, we become we don't want to spend that kind of money. So the problem is once the product reaches there and gets rejected, so that's the, cost that's the en entire uh, shipment value is gone. So yeah. maybe it's worth investing and worth actually spending that extra few rupees. So it is only a question again fixing accountability and who has to incur the cost. Yes. Because somebody is not doing the job right and taking more time and accident is happening. Mm -hmm. And the pharma companies has to give more money or do something because we don't problem. Of course, pharma companies money is not a good thing. Money is not a good thing. It's about the solution to be provided there. That's the only thing. Let's talk about the scientific method. Celebi, you run from that warehouse. They have Amazon. Now they have Amazon. Yes. They have Amazon. Both the cargo terminal operators should have Amazon. No, not actually. You know, the Celebi one, I walked in, I've had discussion with the general manager of Celebi my forwarder etc and i'm talking about a couple of years back ah, now they have yeah i'm saying that you know it took mr joshi the adc many years to convince and that pharma zone to be created there yeah see actually you know, know and exertions were such that you lost millions of dollars right of a product blood plasma products which are made out of human blood which cannot be you know recovered and your point yeah. is valid that they were issued in the and it's only uh, this uh, 
calendar year when they inaugurated the facility for the pharma. So the pharma facility is there now. In the BCC facility, the pharma started about last year when their uh, uh, So now both the facilities in Delhi also have uh, pharma facility. Yeah, pharma that's, that's good to have, but yeah. you know what is the accountability when all the stakeholders are sitting together or not? Yeah. The forwarders, the clearing agents, the uh, com customs, the drug department, health ministry, as well as the GM airport. So I do not see ever in a meeting that I could get everybody onto a table if a discussion had to be taken. <laughs> That's very hard to get. So Either just to add to that, I always mentioned the area for the Asago Forum in India. So that particular body which consists of the airport, the airline, the space forwarder, the PSA, even the experts, and we do call in people from the pharma sector. But yeah, you're right. The customs and the, uh, the drug controller and all, that is a government entity. We try to approach them through this forum, asking them for changes. Some changes they have done also, but a long way to go. So, so uh, are there some questions uh, in other areas uh, in terms of uh, procurement? Uh, yeah, this there from the end. Because we have time only take one more question after this. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Raj Kiran and this question is to Mr. Chandra Mohan. Mm -hmm. uh, your business is extremely seasonal, wherein uh, four months uh, you do 70-80% of the sales typically in the market. So how do you uh, work out your procurement strategy for those vendors for the rest of the month? Because obviously you're not going to give a cost hike during those four months. You'll be as competitive as possible. What happens to your vendors across various uh, categories? in the rest of the month. How do you balance it out? Uh, I'm sure that people will not be so happy every time. So that's my question. Thank you. Uh, first of all, that's, uh, that, that's a question, brilliant question, because uh, this is the, we are trying to uh, find answers for this all the time, uh, especially in a country like India, where we have markets where uh, you, would, you would find it hard to believe that a market which uh, do almost 60% of their entire year volume in quarter two, which is the summer season. So in the balance three quarters, they are doing only 40%. So you can see the spike uh, in the whole supply chain. Uh, so to answer to your point, how we deal with it, we deal with it in a manner where we try to uh, we try to tackle into a supplier base which is not necessarily only catering to the Coca-Cola system. Uh, for example, if you take an ingredient like sugar, we typically would be only a 3 or a 4 percent buyer of a sugar bean. So, you know, that shock of 3, 4 percent in a large pool is very easily manageable. The other big ingredients that we buy is related to packaging. We design our capacity at the supplier level and because these are dedicated capacities, unlike ingredients where you are just pinching into a larger pool. Uh, when you're looking at packaging, where you have dedicated pinching with the designs being produced, we build capacity in a manner where there is storage at the supplier level, there is storage at the plant level. And the economics is very simple. We guarantee that any capacity that comes in at our upstream has to operate eight months, eight to nine months. If that capacity does not operate eight to nine months, that capacity will not come. That is what we owe it to the supplier from a strategy perspective, and that's how we partner with suppliers. Uh, we also encourage suppliers to, uh, you know, hive away 20 to 30 percent of the capacity to other industries which are non seasonal and if possible, uh, which oh, has yeah. a different, different season. Different so it sort of balances out. Uh, but your, your point is right. Unless you don't have a strategy uh, of how you will build your supplier base, you will fail. And the supplier, end of the day, will load it in your pricing, will load it in your quality. Uh, so unless you have applied your mind, you've built your strategy, saying that, no, I will guarantee you a certain utilization, uh, that's how it works. Thank you. Uh, one more question, please. Yeah, ladies on the back side. Uh, yeah, 
My name, my question is uh, to the gentleman from Coca-Cola and Nivea. So, uh, two questions to you. One is that I'd like to hear something about the reverse logistics that you do for your glass bottles. And uh, second question is both to uh, the FDC suppliers to understand that what initiatives are you taking or planning to take for environment-friendly packaging material, be it Nivea tins or be it uh, PET bottles. Because after usage, these are fast-moving products which we buy every day. And after usage, all these tend to add more and more to the environment. So what environment-friendly things are you thinking? Excellent question. If I can answer the first part, uh, and then I sort of will help uh, uh, my other colleague uh, support him when he answers your question to do with sustainable packaging. Uh, for us, recycling business is a huge business. And uh, uh, the earlier point that I made uh, was that we have 57 manufacturing locations. Uh, these 57 manufacturing locations have, I mean, we could have done with only, say, five in each zone, each region, region, and one in the center of the country. But we chose to have it built in this design because as a company, we do not allow uh, glass bottles to travel more than 350 kilometers. Uh, it does not. Okay. So can, can I then ask you to elaborate more on what you wanted? Yeah, I mean, I just want to how you manage it? How you're managing it? Okay. So, so in terms of the transport is? part, the trucking part, uh, I was in the larger hall downstairs, and you know, so there were a lot of people who walked up to me, and they, you know, were saying that uh, uh, we are a logistics company. What solutions can you offer? Uh, and you know, my so I was trying to give them a pushback and telling them that look, you know, you know, who's the country's biggest uh, transport company? And they would smile. Everybody knows the biggest transport company is the Coca-Cola company, and we we have one of the largest fleets uh, in the country. So we manage uh, the trucking part pretty efficiently. And uh, just to throw in a point, uh, we try to design the trucking in such a manner that a shipper it comes into our plant, it is loaded in 40 minutes, and it is out. It goes to a distribution or a warehouse point. It, it, it enters the distribution point, it is unloaded in 40 minutes, it's back on the road. So that kind of efficiency one gets because you have scale and you have learning uh, which have, uh, you know, been there for a long, long time. time. Uh, so you have people who are trained, you have that capability, you have trucks specially designed for that purpose, you have loaders, you have shipping uh, bays, spaces accordingly designed. And that holds true for glasses. So second question was about the sustainability of uh, packing material. Okay. Uh, from a Nivea uh, standpoint, uh, specifically on uh, packaging material revolution, from a sustainability standpoint. So uh, if you notice the blue uh, tin of Nivea, and you're noticing uh, it's also morphing into other packs, the PET pack and uh, other, uh, uh, other pack shapes and all, which are going away from a metallic uh, uh, Standpoint, and we're trying to promote those uh, particular products. Uh, uh, globally, uh, Nivea does a lot of things from a uh, sourcing standpoint in terms of the tracking the carbon footprint of uh, uh, all of these products that and, and where it's being made. But if you look at it, if you're asking whether there are some innovations in packaging which have kind of uh, taken away the negative uh, impact of these packs on the uh, environment uh, per se, I think as an industry, we are still grappling with that particular uh, uh, thought and we are trying to get better at it. So now I think what one of the things which has started happening is the industry started tracking the negative impact of uh, these things on the environment and, and we are tracking those metrics and trying to move away from uh, certain types of uh, packaging while keeping them because they are also iconic uh, packaging uh, shape. But uh, yes, I mean, uh, I think it's a constant uh, uh, challenge which we are trying to address. It. Certain easier challenges on the RM side, raw material side, uh, th those are being uh, taken care of from a product standpoint, from an animal testing and other aspects uh, the company has gone away from and has been one of the pioneers in, in that aspect. And these regulations are now being discussed for India and we've been compliant a uh, long time back. But overall, it's, uh, it's a difficult issue to tackle and uh, it takes uh, some time for the industry to really uh, uh, come to grips as to how we can uh, get something which is uh, you want to make a quick comment on something different yeah. than this? 
so uh, one is because uh, if you look at the coca cola portfolio it's a large portfolio in terms of packaging and uh, we have a simple principle and the principle is the three r's so you reuse uh, you reuse and you recycle and uh, if if you had bought a pet bottle a 600 ml coca cola 5 years back the weight of the bottle would have been 32 grams but yes, today we are down to 24 grams we are innovating to bring it down to 18 grams so that is the, the that is the aspect of reuse uh, the aspect of reuse and recycle is the the the, the whole legislation being moved uh, by companies like us uh, on trying to push the government and saying that can we reuse the feed which comes back Uh, into making bottles, so it is bottle to bottle. So you have the Coca-Cola bottle going out; it comes back and again enters our supply chain. So that is one aspect. Uh, there is something very innovative that uh, we wa- I wanted to share with the group. So this was as far as the front-end supply chain is concerned. Uh, but I take great pride in telling you that uh, we, uh, we as a company, innovated uh, the plant bottle, the plant PET bottle in India. Uh, we have not launched it in india it has been launched in 38 countries it covers almost 19% of the pet consumed by the company what is this plant bottle this plant bottle is uh, we take 30% of its ingredient coming from agriculture uh, unlike a typical pet when you take ppa and you take mg which is coming from crude oil uh, and you convert that into pet we take mg coming out of ethanol ethanol coming out of molasses molasses coming out of sugarcane so we take 30% from that supply chain take 70% because the technology that is available with us only permits us to take this mix to 70 30 we are in the process of creating a full plant bottle which will have 100% coming from the coming from an agricultural uh, source so that makes it sustainable So these are principles that uh, requires sponsorship. It requires sponsorship of the leader. It requires uh, the board of the company saying that go ahead, do it. You know, the the owners are behind you. So this is the right way to approach the subject. Excellent. I think thank you very much. Uh, we had a great discussion, and what came out from the discussion is uh, very clearly brand and quality are the prime. Uh, cost comes later. Sustainability is a big. a uh, thought which is going and very glad to hear thought, thoughts like this which you are talking about a uh, uh, plant bottle co-creation is another concept which came with the supply with the supplier and being part of with them in case of wealth creation uh, also we had very interesting uh, question from audience when they try to hold the suppliers accountable for some of the things which are happening it is a good discussion to happen and we realize that is not one party or two parties can all the problem with us to be solved it has to be solved at a larger level because large number of players are involved so uh, uh, thank you very much audience thank you very much uh, my panelists for uh, giving time and really thankful to all of you thank you uh, well i would like to thank our moderator and all our panelists and of course all our participants to make this extremely interactive uh, now i would like to uh, ask uh, mr ravan meethe our uh, moderator to actually hand over a token of appreciation to all the panelists as we running behind the uh, schedule uh, sincere apologies and few of our speakers uh, have to actually fly back uh, for next panel discussion so if i may request all of you to please pick up your tea and come back to your chairs and we could get started with the next panel discussion thank you so much for your cooperation